Welcome to the Living Myth Podcast with Michael Mead, where this shifting, changing world is looked at from a mythic perspective. Currently, the world is beset by a cascade of crises that seem impossible to solve. Yet, the situation can also be seen as what the ancient Greeks called a Kairos period, a betwixt and between time in which the course of history changes and all of reality seems to be altered. Things become both impossible and more possible at the same time, as life transforms on many levels. A Kairos period often begins with crises that break time open and break down our usual patterns of life. Although radically disorienting, such moments can be transformative, even revelatory as hidden potentials of life become more visible. In that sense, Kairos can be seen as awaken time, moments in which we can awaken to a greater sense of the world and our place in it. And so I want to read, uh, to tell the truth, it's kind of a version of a Rumi poem. Uh, Someone translated Rumi and then I think I translated them. Um, So it's a variation on a poem. And it goes like this. Secretly, the whole world is a form of truth. But when someone cannot feel that, then the forms of the world appear to them as they happen to feel. Life then mirrors their anger, their greed, their fear. In times like this, we have to stretch ourselves between heaven and earth, for that can help turn the lead inside each person's soul into gold. Listen, redemption doesn't come in the end after all the struggles on earth are over. Please read the small print in all the holy books, because it says that redemption, if redemption doesn't occur in this realm, then it won't be found in the next realm either. In other words, that which we imagine as salvation or redemption is to be found here on earth. And one of the ways that it's found is when a Kairos moment occurs and we get access to the eternal. And so I'm thinking also of Ikkyu, who was kind of a trouble, a troublemaking Zen monk. But he said this wonderful thing. How many times do I have to remind you, you can't help but be who you are and where? So that's true for us collectively and individually. We can't help but be who we are and where. We're in this trouble. We didn't ask for it, but it came to us. And then it becomes up to us to figure out what to do. And so I want to put out some ideas that might give some sense to that imagining. And the first thing I think of is this old idea of the macrocosm and the microcosm. I get asked a lot, do you think that humanity has gone as far as it can go? Do you think that nature's finished with the experiment with the human animal? And it's really time to let it go because we've done so much damage to the world. And of course, my answer is no. I think that's a misunderstanding of the nature of human nature. And so here's one way to go after that. So the idea is there's the macrocosm, that's the great cosm of the universe, uh, usually imagined as all the stars in the heavens in their spheres and the song of creation ongoing in this great ocean of night and the stars that seem to go on endlessly and be uncountable. That's the macrocosm. And then there was the idea that there's a microcosm, And the microcosm turned out to be human beings, a micro version of that great cosmos. If we weren't a small version of it, how could we even imagine it? Every tribe, no matter how small it is, has a story of the cosmos, what's in it and how it began. Because human beings are the only cosmologists. We're probably the only mythologists too. And those things tend to be what's missing in the modern world. 
cosmology and understanding of the cosmos and how it works and how we fit into it, and mythology, an understanding or knowing of the ongoing eternal drama, the story of the world, and there's always two stories, the story of the world and the story of the individual soul in the world. Those are the two stories that go on all the time, the macrocosmic story and the microcosmic version of the unique soul of the individual human being. So the microcosm mirrors the, the macrocosm in all kinds of ways. And so usually in mythology and in cosmology, you have more than two because two becomes a polarity and it can get stuck. And so when it comes to cosmology, there are three cosms. Cosm is cosmos. Cosmos means order, like implicate order of the world. And so there's the macro and the micro. And in between is the mesocosm. They're all Greek words, and meso uh, is a Greek word for, uh, that you get like in mezzanine or mesolithic, the middle place. And so the mesocosm is what we call um, the earth. Um, it's the combination of two things, nature and culture. What used to be called the living green garment of nature and the multicolored creative garment of culture. They weren't supposed to be opposed to each other. They're supposed to be connected. And when they are connected, then that's the mesocosm, the middle cosmic order, and everything's fine on earth. And then there are times like these. Things are upside down. Everything gets polarized. And one of the big polarizations is between nature and culture. They have become separate. People have been imagining or thinking of them as separate. And that causes things to kind of fall apart in the middle. And so one of the reasons to have cosmological ideas or mythological stories that talk or show things in that manner is because we can then say the whole thing isn't falling apart. The macrocosm still operates. The stars uh, do their circling at night and, and the planets move and all that happens in the macrocosm. And in the microcosm, that can happen too. People struggle to awaken to who they are, and that's always a possibility. People have inside of them, according to the old stories, a speck of the original star, so that when the first star exploded, they call it the Big Bang nowadays, the idea was everything that was going to be in the world had to be there at the beginning. How else could it be there now if it wasn't there at the beginning? And so we have a speck of that beginning, a speck of star, which inside a person is the spark of their life, the fire of their imagination, the heat of their passion, the root of their capacity for love and longing. And then also that speck is connected or that, or that piece of star is connected to the stars. And that was called a person's destiny, destinari, a Latin word that means of the stars. We are at a certain level of the stars and we're connected to the stars. And I have this, this image that I have to say because it's in my mind like a trouble. And that is to say the um, kind of Bushmen of Africa have this notion that each person has a string, an invisible string that goes from the speck of star in them to the stars up in the cosmos. And when a person dies, that string falls and something falls from the cosmos. A connection is lost. And so that's part of what's happening. But going back to the mesocosm, it doesn't mean that the whole cosmos falls apart. According to mythology, that can't happen. Things get broken. People die. Things get lost. But life goes on in the macrocosm and in the microcosmic depths of the human soul. But what's happening now in terms of cosmological terms is the middle ground is broken. The ground of the mesocosm is broken apart. And in, in, for the title of this, I was calling it broken moments, like tragic moments that we live over and over these days. And so that middle ground is broken, but I'm talking about it for the reason that we can still turn our ten attention and our imagination to the macrocosm. And on the other hand, in the microcosm, the soul is the part of a human being that cannot simply be defeated. So we can be crushed to tears, broken hearted and scared. 
but something in the soul knows that it can survive that just the way the macrocosm survives that. And so it's that something that I think we have to get connected to if we can. The part of us that has the star that can survive this, the part of us that has the genius that could contribute something to the making of another world that doesn't go back to where we were, but makes it a greater possibility for nature and culture to come back together and for humanity to be more human. And so that's in the soul. It's in the soul of everyone, near as I can tell. Everyone comes into this world aimed at something, has a destination. Everyone comes bearing gifts of genius and capacities that are intended to be given to the world. So when everything comes apart, the soul kind of thinks, oh, maybe now they're going to turn to their natural gifts and figure out how to give those. Maybe now people will figure out how to weave things together again. I'm not sure, but I think that's how the soul sees broken moments also as the opening of possibilities. So I'm talking about the soul, and another thing that happens to me a lot is people ask me to distinguish between spirit and soul. Spirit is connected to fire and air, and it tends to ascend and to transcend. Spirit lifts us up and prefers high places like mountaintops and heaven. It seeks a lofty unity that surpasses all distinctions, as in one God, one consciousness, one earth. Spirit offers clear overviews, but soul seeks deeper understandings. Soul connects to water and to earth. It tends to descend, to deepen, and to complicate. Soul is the realm of diversity, the many as opposed to the one. Spirit seeks the supernatural while soul keeps us in touch with all that is natural and earthy and grounded in this world. Spirit involves a kind of solar consciousness, tends towards rationality and a masculine tonality. Soul tends to fluidity, moon-like alterations and a feminine tone. Spirit is bright and definitive, straight as the way. That's spirit talk. Soul is erratic. It's erotic, too. Whatever floats your boat, that's what soul says. Wisdom involves both the call to spirit and the pull to soul. For in this world, both ascent and descent are needed. Downward movement personalizes while upward movement eternalizes. And a human being is called to do both. For wisdom would would help bring heaven down to earth, and soul would connect each living person to the soul of the world. And so that's kind of a prose poem way of approaching the distinctions between spirit and soul. Ultimately, they're connected the way yin and yang are connected, but they are distinct in some way. And they are a way of imagining the job of the human in the middle of this whole drama. I mean, I'm talking mythology, cosmology, living philosophy, the old ideas of why a person is here and how we wind up in a mess and what do we do about it. And so part of what's been lost in the world um, is the vertical imagination. And so now things tend to be very horizontal. The World Wide Web is horizontal. Everybody's connected, but horizontally, and there's less connection vertically. The vertical connection is upward with spirit to the heights of heaven and the heights of imagination and downward with soul to the depths of feeling and the depths of capacity to stand one's ground and be truly kind of earthbound. And we are supposed to be the beings that can do those two things, not to be full of ourselves, not to think that we're in charge, we made that mistake already, but to think that we can be a living vessel for this movement between spirit and soul. And I think if we're going to get ourselves out of the trouble we're in, we don't need horizontal moves. We need vertical imagination that can imagine the world being bigger than it has been. I'm talking about in terms of spirit and in terms of soul. And so this is my, I guess what I'm doing is doing pairings, right? 
like macrocosm, microcosm, spirit and soul. And then the other pairing I want to get to is Kairos and Kronos. So this is a reference to time. Time, we have time and space. That's the places that we inhabit or the things that we live in. And uh, time is a multiple thing. In ancient Greece, they had three kinds of time. Ion, A-I-O-N, was like limitless time, the movement of the spears, uh, the eons, the circling and uh, spiraling of the seasons of the cosmos over and over again, that kind of time, which goes on and on. And then there was chronos, which is the opposite, the word chronos, from which we get chronology, uh, linear time, the ticking of time, minute by minute, hour by hour, the relentless march of time, that's chronos. And then kairos is the breaking open of the moments of linear time, the breaking open of chronological time, the breaking open of historical time. Kairos was the surprise, sudden breaking open of time, which makes eternity available on earth. And so the idea was when change has to occur, it cannot simply occur because of the repetition of the moments and the hours of time and the days of the calendar. That's the daily life. That's time marching on and on. That's kind of what people want to return to. But in the midst of trouble, in a crisis, we're actually closer to Kairos time. And so Kairos is qualitative time, not quantified time. Kairos is also, I call it lived time. So what happens is um, when time breaks, we become more alive if we're ready for it. Uh, Another description of Kairos. Kairos was a young deity in ancient Greece, a young god. And they would say, uh, this is the god of opportunity that moves so fast that you can catch it when it's coming on. But if you miss it when it's coming on, you can never catch it after it's gone. The idea of opportunity um, knocks and you're supposed to open the door. But there were many other ideas inside Kairos. The word opportunity itself means to be moving towards or arriving at a gate or a portal. So the idea then of Kairos becomes time opens and we're in a portal. And if we take advantage of that, if we open ourselves to this opening moment, then the things that are missing in the world try to come in through the gate of open time. And so what that means is some kind of transformation and transcendence becomes possible. And so the idea of Kairos time has in it on one side crisis. There was the Greek word karoi, C-A-R-O-I, which meant crises in historical time. That's what we're in, a crisis of time. And then at the same time, If we're open to it, we're in the Kairos side of it, which is the opening to the capacity to awaken. So you could call it awakened time and also the capacity to kind of transform. And so examples of Kairos time, the ones that come to mind, for instance, falling in love. You fall in love with someone and time breaks open and disappears and you don't know what time it is. It's just time to open to that love. But also dream time is Kairos time and things can be delivered to people. Diagnoses, important visions can come through the dreams. That's the portal to all kinds of possibilities for awakening as well. Um, um, What else could happen? Oh, Time spent in nature, where suddenly time bends or breaks, and we're not part of the marching of the daily world. We're part of the singing of the birds and the silent speech of the trees, and we're in another space and in another time. And why is that valuable? It's directly healing. Kairos time becomes healing time. And if we can't get those openings where time itself becomes healed, then it's hard for us to get healed. And so I'm imagining the crisis we're in as possible Kairos time. Yes, it can be a crisis time and can be a painful, confusing time, 
But because we have removed ourselves from the march of time, we're actually more available to this Kairos time. And my sense of it is the soul thinks when we pull back for whatever reason, when we stop moving so fast through the world as has become typical for modern people, the, co the soul thinks that we're slowing down in order to awaken further, in order to prepare for some kind of transformation of ourselves that could lead to a transformation of the world that we're going back to at some point. And so this kairos is an opening to great time. And so then there's another idea in there that I love. In the moments when we live fully, we're in Kairos time. In the moments when we realize beauty, when we have a connection to a memory of something that happened to us that is essential to us and should never be forgotten, then we're in Kairos, but we're also in lived time. Lived time is when we are fully alive and we have stepped into the drama of life and we are giving and we are receiving and those moments live time they live in us forever just the way someone falling in love can say i'll always love you and they mean it even if they separate a week later it actually was that way because that loving lives on in the person. I hope I'm making sense. The idea is we compile lived experiences that connect the fullness of our soul, the height of our spirit, the depth of our feelings. Those things inside us stay inside us. They live with us. They actually can grow inside us. And that's all part of what I'm calling kairos, the breaking of time, the opening of possibilities. Another aspect of Kairos is when time breaks, all the potential of the beginning comes back and we become more potential as people, more potentially ourselves. I'm suggesting keeping open to the possibility of a Kairos moment or the other phrase in ancient Greece was Kairos season. We could be in a season of opening possibilities. And so one other thing about live time. There's an old philosophical idea that when we die and, our, and we shed the body and the soul continues on, no one can prove that it happens, but then again, no one can prove that it doesn't happen. The soul continues on. What continues on, what lives in the next world, in the afterlife, is the aggregate of lived moments that we had in this world. As Rumi said, if you think redemption is going to happen at the end, after the earthly struggle, it's a mistake. What redemption we find here is how much redemption we find there. And one way to understand it is the lived moments of time, the moments of giving and receiving love, the moments of creating something that's natural to us, whether it's through the art of cooking or the art of painting. The moments where we become agents of creation, we assist in ongoing creation, those live with us forever. And the moments of healing, when we actually understand that we can be part of healing, both receiving it and giving it, they can live with us as well. So that was part of Kairos, lived time. And so from one side, it's a crisis turned the other way, it's a Kairos. It's an opportunity for learning, for healing, and for growing and being more fully living one's own life. I'm just offering those as possibilities. And so um, I think of a story. This is a creation story um, that has in it loss right at the beginning. And so the story starts when Vishnu, Vishnu is the God who dreams up the entire world, all of all of nature and all of culture, all of the animals and the birds and the fishes and the forest all come from this dream that Vishnu is having while floating on the eternal ocean. And then after dreaming all of that up, Vishnu dreams up Brahma. Brahma comes right from the navel of Vishnu. And Brahma is going to be the creator, uh, uh, the manager of life, the one who keeps it all going. And Brahma comes out of the navel out of the dream of Vishnu, and he comes out carrying the Vedas. The Vedas are the original 
holy books. They're the sacred books. Veda means, it's a Sanskrit word that means vision. It's connected to what we call video. And so the Vedas were the books of vision and wisdom. And so Brahma arrives into the world at the beginning of creation with the books of wisdom and vision, and he hands them to Vishnu, and Vishnu begins to look at the Vedas, which he's never seen, because in the beginning, these things were coming out of him, but he didn't know they were coming. They were coming like a dream. And while Vishnu is looking at the book of wisdom and the book of visions, he becomes so enthralled with it, he gets carried away by his own vision, and he drops the Vedas. He drops the sacred books and they have nowhere to fall but except into the eternal sea. And so the sacred books fall to the very bottom of the eternal sea. That is to say, at the very beginning, a kind of mistake is made and the sacred gets lost and wisdom gets lost. And those things that could guide the way and help nature and help culture, they get lost. And so that's a way of understanding that this has happened before. That being lost is part of creation also. Well, anyway, after they get lost, Brahma says to Vishnu, well, you're the one who made the mistake and dropped the holy books and you have to go get them. And so then Vishnu has to go to the very depth of the ocean and in order to do so, he turns himself into a golden fish and swims down to the bottom of the eternal ocean. I don't know how it has its a bottom when it's eternal, but, you know, that's the way they say it, and in mythology, things like that can happen. He gets to the bottom, finds the holy books, finds the sacred knowledge that everybody needs in the world, but he encounters there a demon who has grabbed those books, and a struggle begins in the depths of the ocean, just the way struggles begin in the depths of the human soul when we're trying to find something that is wise about our lives or find trying to find a new vision for ourselves and maybe even for our culture. We wind up in a struggle with things that are opposed to such vision, opposed to such sacredness. And Vishnu wins the struggle just by a little bit. That's how this world apparently works. The good is slightly greater than the not good, and that's what keeps everything going. And Vishnu returns with the Vedas and, and gives them back to Brahma, who gives them to the people who then begin to learn how to imagine, how to vision, and how to find sacredness in themselves and in the world. And so... What I like about the story is the mistake at the beginning. What I like about the story is how uh, the, the sacred gets lost and someone has to go looking for it. And you could imagine the fish as being connected to the deep self or soul, for that was the old idea that each person has a little self. You could call it the ego self. And that self thinks it's in charge of everything, even though it sits on a shaky throne and really does not have enough deep knowledge about what to do in the world. And crisis shakes the, the, the ground of that ego or little self. And if we can just but let go enough, we could then follow that conscious descent down to where the deep self is, to where the deep soul is, Yes, there's bound to be some struggle on the way down, maybe even on the way back. But according to cosmology, according to myth mythology, everybody has a deep self, deep soul that is like a book waiting to be opened, that has the knowledge of who we are and who we're intended to be in this world. And that in certain moments that can be critical moments, kairos moments, we have the capacity to descend. The Greeks called it katabasis, the conscious descent to find what's missing in our lives. And also nowadays, I think it's collective descent to find what's missing and needed in the world so that when we go back, we're not going back to make a facsimile of the old world, which didn't work anyway. We're going back to try to shape with vision, with imagination, with a sense of heart and soul, a world that's more welcoming to all people and more capable of getting people connected to other beings and to nature. I think that's kind of the time we're in. At least I'm imagining that 
and I'm hoping it to be so that things that are lost don't disappear from the world. They just wait to be found. As I said that, I just remembered another great story from India, the churning of the milk ocean. It's another ocean story where the whole ocean has to be churned because things that got lost went to the bottom of the ocean, and one of them was Lakshmi. Lakshmi is the goddess of beauty and wisdom and wealth, and something happened in the world that was insulting to all of those things, and she was kind of forced to descend out of awareness, out of consciousness, and went to the bottom of the world, and when everybody realized that the sacredness was missing and the sacred feminine was missing. They had to figure out how to churn the ocean of time and bring those things back up. So that just came to my mind while I was talking about that descent. So maybe um, there's a lot lost down there. As a matter of fact, in the story of churning the ocean, there's like 39 different amazing things that people used to have access to that are in the bottom and that all come up when the churning occurs. And there's one big shocking thing, kind of like the demon at the bottom when Vishnu goes down. That is to say, when they churn the ocean, before they get to the lost sacred things, before they get to the um, beauty and all that was lost down there, a kind of poison comes out of the ocean and has to be dealt with. And you could say we're living through that crisis where the poisons in the world have risen to the surface and people have turned in poisonous ways against each other. And then some people, of course, always take advantage of the trouble in the world in order to stir things up worse for their own benefit. I'm not naming anybody. I'm just saying that happens too. And we're living a little bit now in the time of poison, which is a crisis, but it's also right next to the time of Kairos, which could have the awakening of souls and the refining of lost things like wisdom, like beauty, and like the sacred. Thank you for listening to and supporting Living Myth. You can further support this podcast by becoming a member of Living Myth Premium. Members receive bonus episodes each month, access to the full archives of nearly 600 episodes, and a 30% discount on all events, courses, and book and audio titles. Learn more and join this growing community of listeners at patreon.com slash living myth. If you enjoy this podcast, we appreciate you leaving a review wherever you listen and sharing with your friends. On behalf of Michael Mead and all of us at Mosaic, we wish you well in the new year and we thank you for your support of our work.